When I was on the mission field and we planted churches, one of the first things we did was we created a prayer team and we created an evangelist, evangelism team. It's like the first, one of the first things we do, right? Hey everyone, hopefully you're doing well. Welcome to the Jesus King podcast. I'm back with Abraham. Yeah. Abraham. Now we're going to talk about evangelism. I'm excited for this one. I'm I know. really excited. Y- you've actually chosen this topic. Yeah. And you're like, we need to do something about it. Yes. And we just want to share a message of encouragement to the churches. But also we want to talk about what we're lacking today yes. as a church. Yeah. Because it, it seems like Sunday routine, Bible studies routine, prayer night routines are becoming more and more important mm. and evangelism is being pushed to the side or non-existent or non-existent yeah. true um just even going out or even encouraging people to speak to their neighbors mm. co-workers um as a reminder yeah because sometimes as a church you might mention it every now and then but reminding the believers weekly to say hey we need to go out we need to encourage people to come and to know the Lord. Yeah. That's important. Well, it's super interesting to me. Um, I think, as we said in um, in a few of the, the episodes, these things don't really happen overnight. They come as a result of a practice of certain things or a negligence of a practice of certain things, like a lack of discipline with something. So we know, like, if you're disciplined, you do something every day, Mm -hmm. right? And it builds you up. Like, if you're a marathon runner, you don't run a marathon on the first go. You you discipline yourself to the point where you can do a quarter of a marathon, a half marathon, or a full marathon. And both of Mm -hmm. us, we could easily do that. But (laughs) yes, we we uh, are. It's kind of like it's it's (laughs) it's a form of training, spiritual training, when it comes to evangelism. Um, but it's also something that's empowered by a source other than us. It's empowered by something heavenly, right? So when Jesus is speaking to the disciples, he says, don't go out yet. So he actually said, don't go. Stay in Jerusalem, right? Until what? Until you receive the dunamis, the power of the Holy Spirit. And then you will be empowered to go out. Yeah, and to Acts be my witnesses. Acts one eight, and you will go out and you will be my witnesses to the ends of the world, right? And the interesting thing is when Jesus is speaking to the disciples in the book of John, he's saying this Holy Spirit, the power of God, the Holy Spirit will bring to remembrance everything I have taught you. Right, And so we look at these two elements. We look at discipline in our training, discipline in our word, in our understanding of the word of God, discipline in our study of the word of God, in being fully assured of what the word of God teaches, what the gospel is, and then being empowered by the spirit to take that information into the world and be his witnesses and preach the good news. And it's interesting because that word good news, euangelion in the Greek, that's the first thing Jesus preaches. He went out and spoke the good news of the kingdom, right? It was like the first words that were uttered in the lips of Jesus when his ministry began. He came to preach the good news, the gospel, the euangelion. And that word good news, it's literally the gospel narrative of, <clears throat> and in the Old Testament, Biser, which is the Hebrew equivalent, that was used when there was a new king being coronated, when he was being, um, when he was officially becoming the king, they would receive the good news of a new king. Or they would receive the good news of a victory, military victory, that they have defeated their enemy. And Jesus did both of those things. He is the new king and he has defeated the kingdom of darkness. That's good news. That's amazing news. And it should be that as Christians, we are so confident in that. We have experienced this transformation from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light in our own lives that we go out there and we're like, we're on the side of the kingdom of light. And our mission is to get people from the kingdom of darkness into our kingdom because this is 
just amazing. We've seen the transformation of God in our own lives. We've seen the goodness of God in our own lives. We've seen the Spirit of God in our own lives. That we're like, if we truly love the people out in the world, this is what we want for them, right? So this is kind of the the underlying foundation for our mission to go and evangelize. We want to see people saved. We want to see them transformed. We want to see the culture, the whole culture, transformed for the glory of Christ. Amen. Uh, I like how you how you bring in those two sides. Um, you're centering Christ in the message of the gospel, of course, and you're centering the work of taking that message into the world through the Spirit of Christ. Mm-hmm. So could you talk a bit more about the Holy Spirit and his role in the way he encourages the believers and yeah. he leads the believers to take that message, which is Christ-centered, mm-hmm. to the non-believers, to when, the world? When, when Paul is speaking in his epistles, he's very um, adamant and he's very directed in telling the people, we didn't come preaching ourselves. It, we didn't come saying, look at me, Paul, look at... Look at all that I have done. Look at my accomplishments. Look at my pedigree. He didn't. He didn't do that. He didn't say we have come preaching ourselves. He said we came in the power of the Spirit. We came with the word of the Lord. We came with the gospel of Jesus. And like the, I think one of the, I mean, it's it's an amazing thing to preach your testimony and what God has done in your life. That's that's an important process there. Paul did that. He spoke of his testimony, how he was a murderer of the 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 church. He the murdered them. He the persecuted. Yep. Yeah. Um, and now he is an instrument of God for the church, right? So he used that part. But the main message, that's not the gospel. So your testimony is not the gospel. Your testimony is is a way for the world to look at something relevant of the gospel, that the gospel actually changed my life. Right? Mm. But the actual gospel is the message of Jesus, right? And so when you're empowered by the Spirit, and when you have the Spirit of God upon you in preaching the gospel, He's going to bring upon you the remembrance and the words of the gospel that will touch the heart of each person that you speak to, right? And the Holy Spirit knows best, right? Everywhere Jesus went, anytime He spoke to someone, He spoke to the woman at the well, He spoke to the Pharisees, He spoke to Nicodemus, each one of those, he spoke the gospel, he preached the gospel, but he preached it in a way that directed the gospel to that person's specific life yeah. and to that to that person's situation. That, that's a good point because sometimes people think the gospel is a script yeah. and they take it to every single person yeah. instead of allowing the Holy Spirit to lead them yeah. to see what the need of that person is mm-hmm. and how they can communicate the gospel t- to their world, right? Yeah. Because um, a person with a family is different than a person who's a teenager, yeah, yeah. is a different than a person who might be from a different religious b- background yeah. to a person being an atheist. They all have a different, uh, there's all different approaches mm. to communicate and connect Christ into their lives. Yeah, yeah. And that, that's, that's an important thing because what happens if it becomes very ritualized and like, all right, this is how you start, this is mm. the middle, this is how it finishes, you might get one or two responses because it, it, it's kind of relevant to a few kind of people, like a few styles yeah. of people, logical people. Like I love Ray Comfort and I know like you, I think he's a he's an amazing evangelist, but he does have a certain script, and that script can kind of work for certain people, but it doesn't work for others. For other people, it's like that, that's a useless analogy or whatnot. Um, I think what happens is when we tend to um, ritualize something, or when we tend to overanalyze a, a logical approach to evangelism, and we say this is how it needs to start, the middle, the finish, it's kind of like a sales pitch. We're selling something. Yeah. But when we have the approach of Jesus in evangelism, which is empowered by the Spirit, informed by the Word of God, to the specific needs of a person, then you have a different dynamic there. Because you're like, you see an approach and you see that the Lord is moving the gospel message, which is always the same. The gospel doesn't change. But he moves the gospel message and sways it into the heart of each person so that they're without excuse, right? Um, and like, there's been moments where 
I'm speaking to a person in I'm not a very harsh person. I'm a very gentle, easy, but there's certain times where I'm very harsh. And I don't know why. I'm like, God, I, I am generally not like this. But it was for that specific person because they needed like a slam, a wake up. That's crazy because I did say something like this a few episodes ago. Yeah. Just in regards that God would lead you in a certain way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To make the gospel make sense to that person. Yeah. And I think we're, we're, we've lost that a bit because now it's just like, how does the gospel make sense to me? Mm-hmm. And that's how I'm going to preach it. That's instead right. of yeah. instead of saying how can I make the gospel make sense to that person in their yeah. culture in their background in their traditions yeah so they can understand the gospel it sounds like it's kind of like if you were a chef and you're making food for people and you cook according to how you like something yeah <laughs> you're gonna have a bunch of people who are just you know not receptive to your product right True. Um, but as Christians that's not the way it is yeah. we know that the Lord has transformed our lives in a certain way, in a certain direction. And and if you have someone who's been in your exact situation, then you could probably go down there relate and relate to it yeah. easily. But you have to be very flexible. And especially like I've been on the mission field and I've been in different contexts. And the way that the gospel is adapted in different contexts is wild. It's, it's insane how the Lord is moving in different places in such radically different ways with the same message. Right, like if I'm in Southeast Asia versus South America versus the Middle East, it's very different the approach. And then within those contexts, different people have different needs, and so the approach changes as well. Like this, I remember this one time. Like when I was in the Middle East, I'm speaking to a Muslim man who has had had a reality. Well, his reality is God is a aggressive, far-off, hard task mask of a God, right? And my natural inclination was to kind of get a bit heavy-handed with him and be like, look, man, this religion that you are following is a death cult, and this is kind of the way that I was, I was speaking to him. And then I felt the spirit. It's a conversation yeah. in the Middle East, so yeah. something like that and happens. I'm like, <laughs> and, then, and then I'm like, I, I felt the spirit restrained me and saying, this is not the way for this one. And so I went, I talked about the gentleness and the love of God as a father. And that was what he received. He's like, wait, God is the father to you. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, you don't know this about Christianity, that God is our father, that he is, he is not just our Lord and our God, but he has adopted us to be his children. He's like, I've never known that. And he, he didn't have a dad. He was an orphan, right? And so this is something that really, really stretched out to him and it took him by surprise, the, by surprise. And he was like, wow. And he really contemplated that. And it was very different because I had this approach and I'm like, I'm sure this is going to get to him. And then halfway through, the Holy Spirit is like, no, 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 down this way. And it was something that I didn't even intend on speaking about, about God being the Father. But it just came out in a in a small sentence and he picked that up. So you're like, okay, well, God knows what he's doing and we just have to be receptive to the spirit. Yeah. And I think that it's a very detriment, detrimental thing when we don't go out and we're not receptive to what the spirit is doing in a certain place to certain people and we're not listening to the voice. We're just listening to our own wisdom or our yeah, own logic. Our own speaking. It, it, it's, it's interesting because... You were there, you're like, I'm here to help this person. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit in the background is like, I'm here to help both. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. I'll lead the preacher yeah. and, and I'll convict the listener. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. That was amazing. And, and the thing is, like, I'm, I'm reading through the book of Acts at the moment and the way Paul is speaking to the Athenians and Mars Hill versus how he spoke to the Jews. And he says this, that I became a Jew to the Jew and I became a Greek to the Greeks and a Gentile to the Gentile. Like, you have different contexts and you have different people that you need to reach and you have a heart to reach them. And sometimes you have to put your ego and your own logic and your own wisdom aside and say, maybe God has a better approach here. And I have to be receptive to that. And I have to be humble enough to say, my approach is not working here, God. What do you have here? There's been times where I'm like, I don't even know what to say here anymore, God. Like I'm, I'm lost for words because nothing I'm saying is reaching this person. And then God takes it from there. It's it's an amazing thing to 
to witness it because I and you and any Christian, we are just messengers here, right? We are just people who are vessels and instruments of God's glory, not for our own, not for our own sakes. And so when I have people that, they write books on effective evangelism and this is the way you have to do it, it's like, well, I think you're missing the mark a little there because sometimes you're not being very, like there's been a kind of cross-cultural uh, or, or counter-cultural um, thing with with the the love of Jesus movement or, you know, nothing but Jesus movement where they go out and they preach just the love of Jesus. Mm. Which, of course, Jesus loves you. We know this. But they only preach the love of Jesus. And that's the way that they feel is going to be the only effective way to reach this culture. It's not. Some people, it may reach them. Some people, the love of Jesus is really what they needed and how it brings them from darkness to light. Other people, they don't even understand what the love of Jesus really means unless you bring to them the weight of the condemnation and wrath that is upon them. Right. You know, I, I, I had a similar testimony to that a long time ago, it would be like maybe seven, eight years ago. Mm. We were in, um, I think it was Malawi. We were in Malawi and, and we met an organization there. It's a Christian organization and they, they do a lot of work with, with children. And, you know, they, they would do a lot of activities and reaching out to children. And through that, they would share Christ with them. And I remember I was speaking to one of the guys that was in charge there. I said, so how, how would you approach a person with um, with Christ to them? And they're like, oh, we would speak about the love of God and, and so on. I said, okay, how would you describe the love of God? And he went on for a while, like, this is the love of God. This is what God done for us. I said, do you, do you speak about the wrath of God to, to people? He's like, no, not really. I said, if I can ask you a question, if you could describe the wrath of God for me, could mm-hmm. you do that? He's like, well, you know, people go to hell. I said, have you noticed your approach to the love of God and to the wrath of God? Yeah. It's, it's two different things yeah. that you're emphasizing on one and you're not spending enough time mm-hmm. and shedding light on the consequences of rejecting Christ. Yeah, And he paused and he's like, oh, this is like a light bulb moment for me. And I said, I encourage you. I don't want you to go hellfire and yeah, so yeah, on. Yeah. But I said, if you're going to say Jesus loves you and that person says, cool, and yeah. walks away, if that person stands in front of God on judgment day and they facing God's wrath mm. and that person will be like, well, one of your followers, all he said is Jesus loves you. Yeah. I, I'm like, okay, cool. Yeah. I walked away. I didn't think there's any consequences to rejecting that mm-hmm. love. So I think as, as Christians, we, we really need to bring that wide perspective of the gospel yeah. and making sure that people get sufficient understanding of the gospel when they walk away. Yeah. I don't want to come and say, you know, you're, you're a sinner and you're heading to hell. Oh, okay. And I'm not sharing the love of God. Or I can't come and say, hey, God loves you. You're such an amazing person. God created you in his image and so on. And yeah, God bless you and yeah. go go your way. None of that is helping. No. We, we really need to come and share the gospel. And I like how he even says in Romans 1, he speaks in, about not being ashamed of the gospel. Mm, the Be- because we see you know, the, the righteousness of God in that. But then also we see God's wrath. In that mm-hmm. if you read Romans 1 16 and onwards yeah. and it's important to shed light on both of them so when that person makes a decision he's not making a decision with having a blind spot mm. in that topic no he's making a decision and assessing it in the sense of okay I can see everything about mm. your message I can make a good informed decision on it yeah but also I'd go a bit further Preaching the gospel is not about just sharing information. It's mm. not just giving information that, oh, there's A, B, C, and you need to evaluate all that. Preaching the gospel needs to be led by the Spirit and needs to be led by the love of God in your heart towards these people. Yeah. I know a lot of people are out there sharing the gospel. They're like, well, because it's my job. Because that's what I have to do. 
right? Um, my pastor told me or, or my elder told me or my parents are telling me, you know, if you're a Christian, you need to tell people I'm, I'm not comfortable with it. Yeah. I don't really want to do it, but I guess it's the right thing to do. I understand you're obeying God despite your feelings, mm -hmm. but I encourage you, just like you would see with the apostles in the early church and the believers in the early church, they were so in love with the sinners that Jesus died for that they would go risking their very own life to share the gospel. That's good. I think what we need to do, because we spoke about this in the beginning, the, the message is Christ-centered. And the work of, of evangelism is spirit-centered. It's where the spirit leads you. But we need to be love-centered as well. And mm -hmm. that comes from Christ and the spirit. Yeah. We need to be love-centered that we are so in love with these people. You're like, I can't let this person walk away mm -hmm. without me sharing the good news to them. The whole counsel of yeah. God. Yeah. And I'm not here to kind of build an empire out of out of a church right because a lot of people say you christians you just want to grow and be more influential in the world and you want to get everyone on your side no it's about taking people out of that way of damnation mm. into an eternal life a way of life to know jesus that's the point of it jesus even came he's saying i, I came here so you know so that you may know the father yeah, yeah. it's It's so we can have a relationship with God. It's not to build an empire on this earth. Because Jesus even said this before Pilate. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. Mm. We're not here to build an empire yeah, as a yeah. church. Like we're not here to, to create, you know, the nation of Christianity. You yeah. know? Like it's like, that's not the goal. You know, if you have Christian nation, it's a great thing, right? It can yeah. be, but that's not the goal. But I kind of, I also had a thought here. Because I've been to many, visited many churches here in Australia, and it's an interesting thing because when I was on the mission field and we planted churches, one of the first things we did was we created a prayer team and we created an evangelist, evangelism team. It's like the first, one of the first things we do, right? But then we come to Australia, it's kind of like the thing that gets put on the, the back shelf. So, and there's a lot of timidity, like people are timid, and intimidated by the culture in speaking about Christ. So they're fine going to church and preaching Christ within a church context, and they're fine with going to Bible study and glorifying God in the study of the Word of God. That's all good. But when it comes outside of that and preaching the gospel to a non-believer, there's a lot of hesitation and there's a lot of intimidation. Why do you think that is? Well, I think you've actually brought the right dynamic. Is mm -hmm. The prayer team sometimes is not there. Mm -hmm. So you're out there to do a job, but you haven't started in prayer. Yeah. You haven't started with the Spirit of God empowering you. Um, I like what Second um, Second Timothy mm -hmm. 1 7. Yeah, one I seven. think that's a very famous one, verse. 6 and 7 is actually. Oh, yeah. yeah. We'll yeah. go 6 and 7. It's saying, Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you. Through the laying of my hands, for God is has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. Mm. I think if we're not being prompted by the Spirit, and that comes through our prayer life, I I've been taught when I was younger, through a lot of um, you know pastors and elders as I was growing in my faith. They always used to say, if you're not preparing yourself in the church mm. in prayer, then you're not going to be prepared when you go and evangelize. Yep. The battle is won in your prayer life. It's not won in on the on the field when mm -hmm. when you're you know sharing the gospel to someone. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so important. Let God let God win the battle. Mm -hmm. And I'm just gonna go claim the victory. I'm not going to go try and fight for God because yeah, yeah. as a lot of pastors say, they say a lion does not need you to defend him. Yeah, Charles a, li yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a lion can defend himself. Just let it out. Yeah. I'm yeah. just here to share the the word of God, which is being, which 
is influencing the heart of the person in yeah. the spirit. Yeah. So I believe if you're not solid in your prayer life, and if you don't have a team to pray before going out, mm. then most of the times you're setting up yourself in, yeah. in failure. And I like, because I've been in so many of them. Most times we come together and we're praying, we're in the spirit of God, we're reading scripture to encourage each other. We're like, guys, we are on fire. Let's go and share yeah. the gospel. I remember some weeks we come, everyone's late, everyone's busy. And sometimes little things uh, which might seem beneficial on the on the field mm -hmm. uh, distract you from prayer. For example, like sometimes we prepare foods oh, yeah. Yeah, in yeah. winter. So we'll go out there and share meals to the homeless and we'll also preach. But we're because we're so busy doing that, mm -hmm. it's distracting us from letting the Holy Spirit uh, burn that fire in our heart so we can go in. So those little things start to quench yeah, the, yeah. the Spirit of God in us. And we become so busy in preparing for evangelism yeah. instead of allowing the Spirit to prepare our hearts for evangelism. This, this happened in Acts, right? Yeah. Where they were, they were becoming busy in the distribution of the foods. And it was actually hindering that passion, that fire that they had for the Word of God and prayer and the preaching of the Word, right? Yeah. And that can be very detrimental as well when we get very caught up in the little organizational stuff and yeah. the, the logistics of certain things that it stops and hinders, which is where delegation in the body of Christ is a very important thing where you can say, look, you have a certain gifting mm -hmm. here yeah. and others have a certain gifting here. So let's distribute you guys focus on this aspect of it, but we need to focus on this. Yeah. Right? Uh, I think the Holy Spirit does a great job in leading that and in delegating that as well. Um, and and I, I like what you were saying in that because there's an element where um, where because of the the backlash of people, right? Because yeah. of the backlash of the world when you're preaching the gospel, it's a great thing to have a team that can encourage one another. Because yeah. you have a lot of lone rangers and one man teams that go out there, and it's it's a it's a very discouraging thing. You go out there, nothing but persecution and backlash and whatnot, and you yeah. have no one to pray with you and encourage mm. you and say, "Look, guys," because I remember Leonard Ravenhill saying something that really touched me. He said, "There is no man and there is no church that is greater than its prayer life." Mm. You know, yeah. remember, I remember like, that. I, yeah. That hit me really hard because that's the mechanism, that's the engine of any kind of ministry. It's how much time you spend with God versus what you're doing for God. Yeah. Because we want to do a lot of things for God, but we're not really with Him, being informed by Him and being being influenced and being being changed by Him yeah. to go and do this effectively. We can even go a step further. You've got Acts chapter 1. Mm. Jesus says, stay in the upper room, pray. When the Spirit comes, you'll be ready. You'll be my witnesses all over the world. Great. The Spirit comes, they're ready. The Spirit is leading them. In Acts chapter 2, they start to preach the gospel. They see fruits, right? Chapter 3, chapter 4, they start to see persecution. Mm -hmm. So it started great. Now chapter 3, they start to see persecution. They get into the temple. You know, you would think... After Jesus' death and resurrection, these Jews would open up their mind now, God's own people. Unfortunately, they start to persecute the the, the disciples. Mm -hmm. Now, in Acts chapter 4, after they imprison and flog the disciples, the disciples go out rejoicing. But in the middle of chapter 4, they don't go home discouraged. Mm -hmm. They go, verse 23 and onwards, if you have time in Acts chapter 4, they go and pray. Mm -hmm. They pray for boldness and they pray for courage. And they did say, they say, why do the nations rage in, in verse 24 at the end of it? And why the people plot in vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together mm -hmm. against the Lord and against his Christ. And then in their prayer, the Bible says that the place started to shake. Mm -hmm. So it's basically... Despite the persecution and imprisonment, God showed 
his own followers, his apostles, that I am in control. Mm. I'm shaking this place up and I'm going to cause havoc in this in these nations. Yeah. Mm. And through that first century, if you look at the spread of the gospel, it was in such a powerful way. And that's what Paul says in, in Romans 15. Mm. He's saying, I went out preaching the gospel through signs and wonders, right? And all these miraculous things. So God can lead you. Yeah. God can accompany that message with miracles. You can see miracles. Sometimes you might even say the most simplest things to people. And in your head, maybe you might think, Why did I even say that? Why did I even <laughs> say that? And that can catch the person's attention. And we're like, wait, you said something that touched my heart. Or you said something that feels like you know my life. Yeah. How do you, how can you share a message that perfectly mm. connects to what I'm going through now? A lot of people have these testimonies. Yeah. There's a lot more to talk about. Yeah, this. this is Just a like, huge, huge yeah, thing. <laughs> it is a huge topic. I think we can do maybe a few more on, on you know, uh, the method of evangelism and, and, yeah. and that kind of thing because it's, it's important. We are vastly... Um, outnumbered by different ideologies and by different attacks on Christianity, and we need to be equipped. Mm. This is one of the one. It's it's a piece of the armor of God, you know, being yeah. you know the, the shoes of the gospel of peace. And this is something we have to be prepared with. We have to dress ourselves with that we're going into the world and we are prepared for this and we are empowered by God for this. Yeah. It's but, super important. Yeah, and we would encourage you, even if if you could do as a homework for yourself. Read Acts chapter 1 all the way to chapter 4 mm. and see how these major events unfold and how God was using his apostles in the way that he pours out his spirit, in the way that they preach and they see thousands of people coming. And then after that, there's persecution. But then they're not discouraged. They go back together mm. and they gather and God just comes and reassures them and brings more boldness, mm. you know, to for them to continue that work. Yeah. So it wasn't that oh it started well and then it didn't go so well after that. Yeah. And let each one go to their own house. And that's what happens. <laughs> it's funny, because I'll tell you now, a lot of people start evangelism projects. Mm -hmm. This you see that in almost every church. But six months later, it's, a year later, it's over. <laughs> two years later. Where, where are they now? Yeah. Okay. I, I think the whole point is I need to love these people and I need to be constantly obedient mm -hmm. to the calling of God. Consistency Just, as well. Yeah. Consistency in like, all right, we go out and we know this is the calling of God to go out and you go out yeah. each week and you don't stop no matter the result. Even if people are not receptive, even if you feel like you're being, even if nothing's happening, you're consistent, 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 and then to a point you're going to start seeing the fruits yeah. of God. If you're ever discouraged, look at the life of Noah. Ooh. 120 <laughs> years, preaching repentance, Poor guy. <laughs> only, only ended up with his family yeah. in the ark. So it's about obedience as well. Just even uh, as much as you love people, and even though they, they're not responding, don't give up. Continue to share. And, and there's one aspect. We we did kind of criticize a little about certain methods. Um, I don't want that to discourage you. Like there's going to be people that will say, oh, man, this is a very complicated thing. So I'm going to go out and I'm going to say the wrong thing. Just go out. Pray, of course. Be informed by prayer and, and spend time with the Lord. Um, but you're going to make mistakes. I mean, yeah, we've all made yeah. mistakes and whatnot. But, but don't be discouraged by the mistakes. Be encouraged by the fact that, as you continue to do this and as you continue to speak to people about Christ, you do get better. And the Spirit empowers you and the Spirit takes you from one faith to a next mm -hmm. faith and from one glory to another glory. And, and you become a well-equipped soldier for the Lord in that sense. So don't be discouraged initially by the mistakes or by the errors you may make because those things are kind of trivial. What's important here is the obedience and that you are being, you are allowing yourself to be used as an instrument of honor for the Lord. So that's my encouragement because I know I made so many mistakes, mm -hmm. and I'm sure that I could look back on pretty much all my early ministry days and early, early um, evangelistic outreaches and the things that I've said. I'm like, God, 
Abram, why did you say that? And I'll pray, Lord <laughs> God, don't hold me against my... But like, Make them forget. <laughs> but like, you look at that and you're like, but you see the progress and you see how even in the evangelistic, um, even in evangelism, even in the preaching of the gospel, God is also shaping you. And he's shaping me and he's shaping you. And we, we are molded into the image of God through that. So it's an amazing process where it's like twofold. One, God is working for the salvation of others, but he's also working in our sanctification as well. Amen. So, yeah. Amen. Well, That's a whole different topic. Right? Yeah, yeah, it is a topic, but it's a nice conclusion. Yeah. We'll, we'll leave yeah. it with that. God bless you all. And we'll see you next time. Take care.